a Northwestern monk who trained in Thailand. And after several years, he went home to visit his family. And his brother asked him, all those years you've been spending as a monk, what did you learn? And the monk said, everything changes. And the brother said, duh, of course. And yet that teaching that everything changes, everything fabricated, everything put together is impermanent, inconstant. It is an important teaching. The question is, why is it important? And to see that it is important, you have to see that it fits into another bigger teaching, which is the teaching of the Four Noble Truths. Venerable Sariputta once said, if you want to understand any skillful quality, any skillful teaching, you have to put it in the context of the Four Noble Truths. Because the truths are not just truths about suffering. There are categories in which you can sort out your thoughts, sort out your experiences. There's one category is stress, suffering. Another category is the cause of suffering, which the Buddha identified as craving. The suffering, he said, is clinging that comes from the craving. Then there's the cessation of suffering, which comes when you can abandon the craving. And finally, there's the path to the cessation. These are the practices that we follow. Each of those truths has a duty. The duty with regard to suffering is to comprehend it. That means to understand it so well that you get beyond any passion, aversion, or delusion around it. The duty with regard to the cause of suffering is to abandon it. The cessation of suffering is something you should realize, and you do that by developing the path. So when you use the Four Noble Truths to divide things up, it's so that you can know what to do with them. Say mindfulness arises. You want to make it right mindfulness, so you develop it in that direction. And then you want to make it stronger, so that's something you develop. When sensual desire comes up, that's something that causes suffering, so that's something you want to abandon. So this gives you the framework, an idea also of what to do with what comes up. And that duty to abandon the cause of suffering and to comprehend suffering itself as clinging. That's where the teaching on what are called the three characteristics come in. Because you're trying to develop dispassion for the cause of suffering and some dispassion for the like, suffering itself. You might not think that you're passionate for suffering. But as the Buddha said, it's the things we cling to. The act of clinging, that's suffering. And the clinging is something we do because we like something. We think we're going to get something out of it. So we keep doing it again and again and again. So what we have to do is learn how to see that we're not getting the satisfaction we hoped for. And the same with craving. We crave things because we think they will bring happiness. We have to learn how to see that they're not bringing us the happiness we want. So in cases like that, the Buddha gives us some training on how to develop dispassion so that you can abandon the cause of suffering. And there are five steps. If something unskillful comes up in the mind, you want to see it as soon as it comes, so that you can see what's causing it, what incites it. The Buddha uses the word samudhya, which translates as origination. And when the Buddha uses that word, he's usually talking about causes coming from within the mind itself. So say when sensual desire comes up, you're not thinking about the object outside that got you excited. What was the tendency in the mind that wanted to get excited to begin with? That's what you want to look for. That's the origination. And then you want to see that the things that originate these unskillful mental states come and go, come and go. So you want to see them when they go. Because sometimes, say, we get angry about something, and the anger is there for a while, and then it disappears. You lose interest. You find something else more interesting instead. But then you go back to the anger. 
you may notice that the feeling of anger in the body, which is basically not so much the feeling of anger itself, but it's the hormones that get released when you're angry. They're still there. They're still having an impact on how you experience your body. So you want to be able to distinguish the thought of anger from the physical results of that. But all too often when we have those physical results, we think, well, I must still be angry. So you pick it up again, run with it some more. But if you're going to see the distinction, the thought of anger and the physical results, those are two different things. That helps loosen your attachment. You begin to see that the mind's choice of these unskillful attitudes is pretty random. And it does have the choice. You can pick it up or not. So when you pick up anger like that, the next step you want to see is, what's the allure? What does the mind like about anger? We may tell ourselves that we don't like anger. We see the bad effects it has in other people's lives. And we can see that it's having a bad effect on our lives. But as long as you don't understand why you like it, or part of the mind likes it, you're really not going to be able to let it go. So you have to look for the allure. And then the next step, the fourth step, is to compare that with the drawbacks. That if you go with the anger, what's going to happen? What kind of results are you going to get? Are they going to be worth it? And this is where the three characteristics, or more properly, the three perceptions come in. You can see that whatever benefits you get from the anger are inconstant, they're not reliable. Because you can't rely on them, you can't find any real happiness there. So they're stressful. And when they're unreliable and stressful, do you really want to claim them as yours, as belonging to you? When you can see that the drawbacks really do outweigh the allure, that's when you let go. That's when you develop this dispassion, which is the duty with regard to the Second Noble Truth. So that's where this teaching fits in. That's why it has meaning. It's in the context of the Four Noble Truths. You see that unskillful mental states are really preventing you from being truly happy, and you want to find some way to get past them. So contemplating in terms of their being constant, stressful, not self, that helps loosen your attachments. Because it's in the context of the Four Noble Truths that these three perceptions actually have meaning. If you didn't understand that the craving causes suffering, or the clinging is a suffering, you say, I might as well hold on. What's wrong with holding on? And if you think this is all you've got in life, you hold on even more. If you take the three characteristics or the three perceptions just on their own, you could come up with all kinds of ideas about what to do. Things are impermanent, things are stressful. So if you get a little bit of pleasure, hold on to it. That would be one conclusion. Or, as they say in the old drinking song, eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we may die. In other words, you try to grab whatever pleasures you can in what little time you have. Those would be reasonable attitudes to have if you didn't take into consideration the Four Noble Truths. But when you see things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, and the Buddha says, true happiness, the cessation of suffering, comes when you abandon all your passion for craving, all your passion for clinging. Then those three perceptions have meaning. You realize that they're a way to perform the duties of the Four Noble Truths and to get to that third Noble Truth, which is the total end of suffering. Of all the truths, that's the most important. If the Buddha were just making some observations that there is suffering in life, things are in constant stressful, not self. And if he just left it there, one of the messages might be, well, just learn how to accept things, that this is as good as they get, and don't try, to, don't try very hard to get them any better than this. The image they sometimes give when they teach it this way, and, and you do find people teaching this this way, claiming that it's Buddhism. They say it's like sitting on the shore of an ocean, and waves come in, big waves come in, little waves come in, gentle waves come in, destructive waves come in. There's nothing you can do about it. Just re realize, okay, they come and then they go, and that's their, they're doing their wave thing. 
if you get upset about the strong waves. But you can't do anything about them. You're getting upset for no purpose at all. So just learn how to accept them. Stay there on the shore and watch the waves come and go and learn how to be happy that way. That's one of the ways you can interpret those three characteristics or those three perceptions. If you didn't have the context of the Four Noble Truths. But with the context of the Four Noble Truths, you realize you're suffering because of your own passion, fear, craving. If you learn how to develop dispassion, and the Buddha gives you this five-step program, seeing how your cravings arise, seeing how they pass away, and when they arise, seeing what in the mind gives rise to them, seeing how they pass away, seeing their allure, seeing their drawbacks, and through comparing the allure with the drawbacks and seeing that the drawbacks way outweigh the allure, that's when you can develop dispassion. That's when you're free. Because that's the purpose of these perceptions, is to get you free. But it's all within the context of the Four Noble Truths. That's what, how they make sense. So they're not just a duh teaching. They're very insightful. So anyway, that you can see the drawbacks of the things that you cling to, the things that you crave. It's all going to be useful. Some people get most impressed by the fact of how unreliable the happiness that comes from craving is. Some people get more impressed by the fact that there really is some stress, even in the things that you really, really like. The fact that you have to hold on to them keep them going. They find that that impresses the mind more. Now, other people find that when you realize that these things are not totally under your control, that sometimes they give good results, sometimes they don't give good results, but the results they give are never as long-lasting as you'd like. Why hold on to them when you know that by letting go there's an even greater happiness? So always look at the Buddha's teachings in terms of these Four Noble Truths if you want to make sense out of them, get the best use out of them, because they are meant to be used. The Buddha wasn't the sort of teacher who would just say, well, this is the nature of the world. He's more interested in solving a problem. The problem that drives all of us is that we're causing, us our <clears throat> we're causing ourselves suffering through our actions, and we don't have to do it. That's the whole focus of his teachings, that all the teachings he has, all the teachings he gives, come with that purpose. They're for you to use on your own suffering, events of craving in your mind, clinging in your mind. Think of the teachings as tools, or in the Buddha's analogy, he compares them to a raft. You're on this side of the river, it's a dangerous side, there's a lot of suffering. On the other side of the river, there's safety. And there's no bridge across the river, and there's no boat to come and pick you up. So you have to take the twigs and branches and leaves on this side of the river, bind, together, <clears throat> bind them together with the vines you find in this side of the river, and make a raft. And then making use of that raft, you swim across to safety. When you get to the other side, you can put the raft away. You don't have to carry it on your head. But notice what that raft is made of. It's made out of things on this side of the river, your thoughts, your feelings, your perceptions, the things that you cling to. But you find that if you put them together in the right way, as you are when you're getting the mind in concentration, you focus on the breath to create a feeling of ease. Use the perception of the breath filling the body, the ease filling the body. You think about how to improve the breath to make it more comfortable, how to maintain that sense of comfort, and then how to spread that sense of comfort throughout the body. And then you're aware of all these activities. That's taking all the things that you cling to and turning them into a path, turning them into the raft. So instead of just sitting on the side of an ocean, watching the waves come and go and not being able to do anything about it, the Buddha is giving you something you can do. Take what you've got, learn how to use it skillfully, 
and you can get yourself across to true safety. That's the image you want to hold in mind. <laughs>